Welcome to Harris Victory Garden, the cannabis-centric show with a little something for everyone. Harris Victory Garden is brought to you by PodSquadPDX.com, painless podcasting, by the Narrowband Broadcast Network, NBBN, the focus is on you, and by the support of our listeners and subscribers through Patreon. Patreon, create on your own terms. On this episode, Chris can't help but keep taking it out and looking at it. Andrew remains nauseously optimistic. And Mark declares sugar illegal, just in time for the holidays. Thanksgiving? After this year? I've barely even got any f**ks left to give. Where's mommy's vape pen? Anyway, here's your host, Andrew Scott. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Hare's Victory Garden, Vote 2020. No, fuck that. We're going to talk about weed. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Harris Victory Garden with Mark Hare. I'm Andrew Scott, along with my partner, Chris Vacano, and the man of the hour, Mark Hare. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing pretty fabulous. How are you guys this morning? Doing great. Yep. I got things to smile about for the first time in what feels like forever. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. everybody uh, has been following along for the last week uh, about the vote. The vote is done. We have a president elect in uh, Joe Biden and our first. Wow. Yeah. She's breaking a lot of glass here. Uh, our first female executive, our first uh, woman of color as an executive in the United States and the first uh, Asian, Asian American. Yeah, Asian American, Kamala Harris. And, and uh, the first uh, one generation child of an Im- immigrant. That That's right. Thanks for bringing that up. I tend to kind of overlook that. She, uh, yeah, she's first generation American. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, really no matter where you sit on the political spectrum, I think that this is cause for celebration. This is, uh, a, a way for the world to look at us as America growing again, you know, really, frankly, we've been behind the times when it comes to female executives, uh, so many nations around the world have had. Uh, female representation in their executive branch, whether it wind up being Theresa May in the UK or uh, Angela Merkel in Germany or New Zealand or, you know, we've been behind the times and it's really nice to see well, us getting getting you know, caught up in that regard. Even even thinking back to, you know, to the late 80s, Corazon Aquino in uh, the Philippines. Oh, true. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean, we like to kind of Americans kind of like to look down their sleeve at the Philippines as being a little bit, you know, maybe sort of backwards and not, not quite as progressed as we are, but wow, they, they're they ahead of us by, by decades on, on that matter. Absolutely. Right. And, uh, yes. Yeah, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about who's president because you've got 8,274,329 different vectors to listen to people talk about the presidential race right now. We're just here to say that was a thing and now it's done. And it's going to be, as all of us suspect, it's going to be an interesting transition of power. I think that's the most uh, neutral and polite way to say it. I think the only thing that we want to say here from Harris Victory Garden is we're glad that you voted. More people voted in this election than any other election in history, both by percent and by sheer numbers. Yeah, I just I just looked up some numbers. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is really interesting stuff. <clears throat> so in the U.S., uh, as of 2018, uh, there were approximately uh, 234 million eligible voters. Okay, uh, the U.S. This population... Year, uh, 2018. So this year would okay. be roughly comparable, um, maybe just a little higher. What was that number? Again? Uh, 234 million. 234 million out of a population of roughly 360 million. Actually, 328 million 320? is okay, thank the number. Yeah, is the number I found. Um, so it's you know it's approximately two thirds. Now, 
looking at this year's election, we had close to 150 million participants. Wow. That's nearly two thirds of the eligible voting populace. That's wow. pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, that, that's progress for the for United an, States. Yeah, for that, a nation who historically, who historically kind of throws up its hands at elections and goes, eh, does it really matter? Uh, this is the first time in a long time where I felt like the population realized, yeah, you know, this does matter. And throw on top of everything, the fact that we're in not only the midst of, but we are on an upward swing when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. And we've yeah. only got, what, six states in the United States that regularly allow for for vote by mail here in Oregon, Washington. California's got a pretty robust vote by, vote by mail system. Uh, but it's new to most of our country vote by mail, and we won't even go into pitching vote by mail nationally. <laughs> but for that many people, yeah, for that Sorry. many, well, it's okay. It's easy for us to sit back and kind of laugh at the rest of the nation because we're just like, yeah, I'll vote. Okay, well, make sure it, this gets out in the mail. <laughs> I mean, you that's, know, I think, that's I think the 22 thing. years now, 1998 is when that was enacted. Yeah, in, uh, you in, know, in Oregon. Yes. My yeah, my prediction here is that uh, 2020 is going to be something of a touchstone year for a lot of states to say, you know what, we yeah. did it. There wasn't anything to be scared of. Mm -hmm. It actually worked out surprisingly well. Depending you know who you are and how you let's voted. right. <laughs> let's run yeah. with this. Well, I, I I mean, if you're a Secretary of State, you're you're not you're not looking at it through those lenses. You're looking at it through how, <coughs> how it was, you know, how manageable it was and, Simple and how safe it was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think honestly, um, you know, there are probably a fair number of secretary of States across the country right now who are looking at this going, you know, it was a whole lot easier to manage poll workers. We didn't have polling machines to dick around with. We uh, didn't have, you know, all of the usual voting day garbage that we've seen for the last several cycles. Yeah. And 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 they may be looking at it going, you know, this this isn't such a bad thing. Well, and, and I think one of the things that people tend to let get past them when they're talking about vote by mail. And this is something that, of course, was a huge concern for us here in this election. You know, ripples from 2016 when we know that we had active interference by outside nations dicking around with our vote. One of the things that vote by mail really helps neutralize is that because vote by mail is still a physical process. You that can't you hack can, it. Yeah, you can't really hack it. Now, you could possibly argue that outside actors could hack reporting or could, you know, any of a number of other digital things that vote by mail is dependent upon. But the physical process of getting your vote to your state electors is kind of bulletproof. The only thing that it depends on, hello, the only thing that it depends on is a working post office, a working postal system. And even after a lot of questions about the ability of our post office to handle this massive influx of vote by mail this year, an unprecedented amount of vote by mail, no hiccups. And we've got no hiccups across the board when it comes to this vote. Fox News even reported that there really was no true detectable levels of, of voter fraud or voter interference in this election. Not only that, uh, what's her name? Uh, the Fox News actually shut down a show. Uh, I can't remember the gal's name. I apologize. It must have been Laura Ingram. I think it was Laura Ingram. Um, they put her show on pause because she was planning on coming out uh, either yesterday or today on her show saying that there's wide reported voter fraud and f even fox news oh, wow yeah even fox news pumped said, the brakes nope. on that and said no we're not we're not playing that we're not we're not doing that there is no voter fraud um if it is it's as minuscule as it has ever been because i mean there there are attempts at voter fraud every year you know we had those two turkeys who rolled out from virginia into pennsylvania uh in a silver hummer uh, with with weapons and they were trying to they were trying to bring in false ballots well they got they got busted with a parking ticket 
because they parked their Hummer in the wrong place. And of course, they had a QAnon hat right on the dashboard. Real, <laughs> really, guys, you're not even you're not even doing espionage right. But, right. Um, you know, there's always a little bit of voter fraud. There's always people that try to muck around. It's inconsequential. It is absolutely minuscule. So really what this and this is I have a hard time sometimes saying that I'm proud of my nation in certain ways. But the one thing I really am proud of this year, in the midst of the worst global pandemic in 100 years, we were able to vote and the vote and the voting process stood up to the to really significant hurdles and work. Mm -hmm. It worked as it should. And it worked as it should. Everybody was complaining about how long it took. Yeah, it took that long. Why? Because it takes that long. Well, and it, it always well, takes that long. Well, yeah. not necessarily so much that, but the few states, um, there were a few new states to the process or newer states to the process or um, like, like most states couldn't actually start counting their absentee ballots or their mail-in ballots until the day of or like 10 right. hours before mm -hmm. uh, the polls closed or just the day before, which seems silly when you're talking about millions of ballots, but something that can be fine-tuned easily. Yeah. You know, they yeah. put it into their state constitution. This is the mm -hmm. way it goes, which is right. fine. Yeah, and you know what? You got to pat those states on the back, too, for your first time doing this. Hey, good job. You actually you right. did You, you yeah. did pretty good. Yeah. I mean, they really sterile they really did a pretty right. admirable job. Five. Yeah, you I, know, you know, I, I think I, overall, I, we got a lot to be thankful for in this election as far as mechanics go. Chris, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, I'd like to build on what you were saying. Uh, you know, the that uh, we got this, we got this strong reassurance. I think I, all of us uh, got the strong reassurance that the structures are still stable. The 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 you know the guardrails are still in place. That that democracy is is still very much alive and well in the United States. Well, not only alive and, and well, but resilient resilient yeah bouncing back from uh you know some pretty pretty frightening looking uh trajectory that that we were on and you know i think we 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 saw a, a pretty strong pretty loud pretty emphatic comeback <coughs> from everybody across the political spectrum and 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 this is not ideological and, and 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 that gets to kind of the other thing that that I take a lot of reassurance out of this, um, and I, I, you know I I'm very strong in in sort of my own views and my own position. Uh, Andrew, uh, Mark, this is no surprise to you guys. Uh, I, I mean, you know where I come down on a lot of things, but what I take is so reassuring is what I saw this week. And, and for the last couple months, but especially manifesting this week is Americans care really intensely about, about America and, and about their views. And yeah, our views, a lot of times they're in direct opposition to each other. A lot of times they're in conflict. A lot of times, uh, you know, we're up in each other's faces screaming and shouting and, and, and it's drifted into a direction where it's gotten maybe a little too hot, but the fact that people took that risk, you know, figured out or, or, or made the effort, spent the energy to figure out how to do it safely, how to, how to get their vote in and have their voice heard and express their position. Uh, you know, I take a lot of comfort in that. I, you know, I'm, I'm frustrated that nearly half of America sees things in a very, very different way than I do. But, but at the same time, I mean, that's America. I, that's I, I mean, that really is America. I agree. It's, I agree, Mark. We that is the beauty fight. of America. Yeah. You know, yeah. that you can, you know, generally speaking, you know, you can worship any god or goddess that you like in America without fear of prosecution or uh, or being held down in any way or uh, being, uh, you know, I don't know, racially profiled, as it were. Uh, 
I think there's a there's a lot of good that came out of uh, this this year uh, in many ways. I mean, there was a lot of a lot of negative, a lot of bad things that happened. But you know, bad things happening are the only way really to figure out how to turn that negative into a positive for the future. I mean, you know, fire departments around the country are probably figuring out how to upgrade their facilities and and do the right thing next time or be better equipped or uh betty you know better on the response um so you know as bad as this year was we all learned a lot yeah exactly exactly kenny from we did. uh from south park we all learned something <laughs> today uh, i i agree I, I, I agree yeah. with you both and um you know i i think that the takeaway for me is that it, again is one of resilience that yeah at the worst time in our lives i'd argue um the mechanism still worked and the mechanism bended but didn't break and i think the the one thing that i've got from this that is my feel-good story is uh in philadelphia um a, a bunch of uh i guess i call it, i don't know if they're protesters or supporters um but they're standing outside an election center and the uh postal van rolls up and the crowd erupted in applause for uh, the postal worker bringing in postal ballots to be counted mm -hmm. um and uh wow. you know we're, we'll we'll leave off the discussion of uh, our gut right <laughs> of our government yeah. of our government uh possibly trying to hamstring the post postal service because right now we're we're headed into uh a scary period here if we thought it was scary back in february when this pandemic started it's going to get scarier and people are still locked down in many many places and of course in places where they're not numbers are getting really bad people are dependent on the postal service i don't necessarily like it people are dependent upon amazon i mean i get amazon at least two or three times a week just for like things that i would normally just pop out to the store to get we need to look at these people who are doing this work and be truly grateful whether whether it's them delivering you your prescriptions, whether it's delivering you your new bidet or <laughs> whether it's them carrying your, your vote, or, or, you know, or, or, or like me yesterday, uh, uh, new windshield wiper blades. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, normally the been things. Things. why the, yeah, why the hell do you need those? Where are you going right now? <laughs> well, have, uh, yeah, but have you heard the, the wiper blades on my car? I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, it's like first world not. problems. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. listen, we're going to take a break. <laughs> yeah. We will be right back because we've talked about the president's stuff. We got other stuff to talk about as far as the vote 2020 goes. And we'll do that when we come back in just a minute at the Harris Victory Garden podcast featuring Mark Hare. I'm Andrew Scott. That's Chris Picano. We will be back in just a second. Hey, that was a nice tight 15 minutes worth of talk. And, uh, yeah, we didn't scream too far afield. Anybody need to take a quick break or anything? Any, anything? 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 Uh, I'm going to have a cup of coffee real quick. Come on, Harry, get your shit together. Get your shit together. Hey, everybody, Andrew Scott here, the host of Hare's Victory Garden Podcast. Have you got a question for Mark Harer? How about a topic you'd like to hear us discuss? Go on and give us a shout at talkback at hvgpodcast.com. If we can include it in the podcast, we will. Again. That's talkback at hvgpodcast.com. And as always, don't forget to click like and subscribe. Now let's get back to the show. And we're back on the Harris Victory Garden podcast featuring Mark Hare. I'm Andrew Scott along with my partner Chris Vacano and Mark Hare. And there's other stuff to talk about with regards to the 2020 election. Um, and... Uh, you know there was uh there was some big gains that happened uh in in the world of cannabis regarding the 2020 election and uh 
Yeah, there's been a lot of gains that have been made uh, by cannabis, both in the medical sense and the recreational sense. And obviously, one of the things that we lean on, although we all support medical cannabis here on Harris Victory Garden, is the the legalization of recreational use of cannabis around the country. Uh, we've got uh, a number of states in the 2020 election that have passed measures allowing for recreational use or commercial sales of cannabis um, around the country. Uh, the two the two biggest ones, we've got Arizona and Montana and New Jersey and South Dakota have all cleared cannabis for adult use, and that brings the total number of states that have approved it for recreational use up to 15. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. But, you know, Arizona by itself, Arizona and New Jersey, they're predicting within a couple of years of this legalization move, you're talking about billion dollar markets in recreational <laughs> and commercial cannabis. Um, and, uh, having, having done my first two years of college at Arizona state, I can attest to the <laughs> fact that there is a huge market in Arizona. <laughs> well, I think one of the other things that I'm interested about is, you know, here in the Pacific Northwest and Mark, you can speak to this specifically having worked in the, uh, the commercial growing industry here in the state. You know, there are times where we we tend to struggle a little bit here in the Pacific Northwest with our weather and the ability to grow large crops outdoors. Boy, you ain't going to have that problem in Arizona. I yeah. I am really looking forward to seeing the infrastructure that gets developed to commercialize on cannabis in some place where they're they got nothing but sun. I mean, I think what Arizona uh Last time I heard a number, I think Arizona Arizona only clocks about eighty days a year with measurable cloud cover. So, uh, and they yeah. peak out. What did they peak out at? One hundred and twenty-one. No, oh, some or insane. LA yeah. peaked out at one hundred and twenty-one this year. Still, I think their average high for the summer is one hundred fifteen, which is insane. Yeah, it's actually. Next, I mean, it's it's a good point to bring up the outdoor growing uh, as long as it's truly strictly outdoor, you know, no light depth, stuff like that. Uh, and for our listeners, for, for our listeners, light deprivation is a technique where you can have the flowering cycle of a cannabis plant happen pretty much whenever you want by depriving it of light and light depth is when you're able to, let's say in a greenhouse, you're able to cover the entire greenhouse with blackout cloth. Uh, which is easy for a small home grower, not so easy when you're talking about a commercial greenhouse. Uh, yeah, so uh, with with an indoor, outdoor slash light depth situation, uh, in heat like that, you would have to spend so much money on air conditioning to keep the plants at you know a reasonable eighty five degree max. You know, yeah. seventy five to eighty five is like ideal indoor grow temperatures. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would have to be strictly outdoor, but the weed they would grow. Good Lord. Oh, my Yankee. <laughs> yeah. And Crazy. it's, it's uh, that's something else that a lot of people don't understand about, about cannabis is that there are ideal conditions for it to grow and there are less than ideal conditions for it to grow. <laughs> Can, cannabis, right? Yeah. We, we know the unideal stuff. Cannabis is, is really fantastic at maximizing its potential against environmental odds but the quality difference is something that's very noticeable uh, especially for old school indoor growers like me and and mark's got a lot of experience in this as well you know if you can keep your plants really the 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 golden the golden area of temperatures between 72 and 78 degrees fahrenheit whenever the plant is being exposed to light you get up into the 80s and yeah, the plant's still going to grow. It's still going to put up buds. It's still going to be smokable, but it's not going to be the same as that when you get it in that Goldilocks zone of temperature. So yeah, Mark, you're absolutely right. I, I think the people that are most excited about cannabis growing in Arizona are HVAC guys because right. gonna be, <laughs> they are going to be busy <laughs> sons of guns company. Yeah, yeah. yeah right and the power company um but you know Arizona one of the other interesting things about Arizona Arizona is that it's very progressive when it comes to alternative energy so <laughs> but you know w it's going to be interesting to see what commercial growers do with things like 
uh, solar voltaic, photovoltaic uh, solar energy. Uh, heat, yeah, heat dissipation alone is going to be, I, th I think what's going to happen is, and I, I don't mean to overstate this, but I think this is actually going to bear some fruits in other places in the same way that the space race and the space program, you know, we've got cell phones because of the space program. We've got, um, you know, heat dissipation technology for our cars because of the space program. It's all what this extreme environment and this extreme task, mm -hmm. it, those are the side benefits of it. And I think we're going to start seeing that from places like Arizona that are going to be doing this particular crop that has particular needs. And yeah, how can we keep the temperature down? Mm -hmm. um, how can we, how can we line greenhouses with materials that maybe haven't been developed yet that will allow you to have the effect of the sun but mitigate the effect of the heat i think that we're going to see downstream from this process a lot of very interesting things come yeah up. a lot of a lot of technological innovation that that just comes out of you know uh, out of thin air as it were <laughs> ah, i see what you did that, that yeah, that comes out of taking a a relatively uh, sensitive plant and making it grow in a really inhospitable environment. Yeah, and uh, I'm gonna jump in real quick here. So uh, I think last time we spoke, I told you guys about the Good News Network. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't. Okay, it's an app. There's an app for that. Uh, on October 26, Solar. Uh, this is an article written by a guy named, I am assuming a guy named Andy Corbley. Solar is now the cheapest electricity in history and just met 100% of demand in South Australia for the first time. Yep. Australia is way ahead of the curve on that. Outstanding. Uh, electricity demands of solar energy for the first time over the weekend. Most of it coming not from solar farms, but PV fanels mounted on rooftops. Yep. A combination of cloudless skies, lower energy low energy demand and mild temperatures help create conditions for 76% of circulating power to be generated by rooftop solar with utility scale solar farms making up the rest. Both sources combined to make 1.37 gigawatts of available power, which would have generated 986 metric tons of CO2 and would normally require 1 million pounds of coal or 10, 100,000 gallons of gasoline. Um, it's the way forward. It's the way that we're yeah. going to wind up cleaning up this mess. There's, I mean, if you just think, and I'm preaching to most of the converted here, but if you just think about the square footage of roofs that we live under and the fact that we've got them covered in tar paper and gravel for the <laughs> most part, and they're just absorbing heat and just the sheer square footage of that alone means we have enough surface to harv. I mean, we're getting oh. pummeled by energy every single second of every single day, you know, and no offense to people who think that windmills cause cancer or anything, but all that energy that our planet is bathed in, we just don't do anything with it. We dig down into the ground and we pull out energy stores that have been there for 65 million years and we depend on that and it's a finite resource finite resource our sun is going to exist in its current state for at least another four million years before it gets big enough to swallow the earth it's free all we got to do is figure out how to and, use it and 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 we can't drain it it's it's bottom right. yeah you know exactly. it's, it's it, it you know, what about that, when that, it gets dark the fact that we're capturing light <laughs> off of it, you know, it's light that was coming anyway. And, you know, to the point that you raised, uh, stick and drywall construction. Oh, yeah. I mean, the way we do things is is insane. I mean, as you pointed out, you know, our roofs are sitting there absorbing heat. Then we're paying huge amounts, you know, high power bills in the summertime. And we were talking about Arizona. This is big time deal, you know, because if you don't have... Uh, air conditioning, you at least have a swamp cooler and it's running all the time. Right. And, and so we've got all of this energy pummeling our roofs, heating up our houses, 
And then we're burning all sorts of electricity to cool our houses back down. And and it, 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 it's just absolutely we nonsensical spend more and money. <laughs> Yeah, we spend more money mitigating the effects of the sun than we do harvesting the effects of the sun. And that's upside down. You know? Well, and there's, you know, there's, there's, uh, yeah, it is, it is absolutely. Ladies and, and gentlemen, can you tell we're all potheads? Right. Uh, we've gone from doing a pot show to energy needs. Hey, in the okay. US well, I tell you what, let's let's dovetail. Let's, let's <laughs> thank you for the correction, of Chris, course. Finish your thought, and then we'll <laughs> yeah, let me let me finish my finish thought here. Thought. Uh, <laughs> this this is actually something that I've been playing with, and and sort of mentally Not exploring here, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah jeffrey tubin <laughs> mad props to you sir um uh, <laughs> because who who really honestly who hasn't ha hasn't had the temptation to do that on a zoom meeting uh no Me. i'm kidding uh but um no my I've, I've, it's it's something that i take out and i look at and i've been thinking about for for I don't several want years you to take out and look at it <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, you keep you giving me open. To the chase, Chris, or you're gonna be buried this way. Yeah, don't yeah, worry, I'll I put this in the blooper reel. Carry on. Yeah, this is hilarious. Anyways, <laughs> so aside from the uh progress made by cannabis across the nation, we here in Oregon uh have not one but two things uh to be I'll I'll say it to be proud of. Uh a lot of people around the country um, don't understand that Oregon uh, has a very robust system of uh, making statewide decisions by ballot measures, uh, which which makes us a little bit different. Or you know, a lot of the West Coast makes decisions by ballot measures, which is not what happens around the rest of the country. But here, one of the reasons why we ever wound up with medical cannabis in Oregon was by ballot measure. Uh, same thing with Washington state, same thing with California. Uh, but that was 20 years ago and some now, uh, Oregon on the 2020 ballot has by voter decree said that, uh, possession of class a substances, which, at, up until last week, uh, was, uh, a, uh, was a jailable offense, was a prosecutable offense, um, we've decriminalized uh, effectively all hard drugs, including heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, MDMA, and, uh, and, and mushrooms. Um, in small quantities. In small quantities, in reasonable, what they refer to as personal use quantities. I believe it's uh, 10 hits of acid, one gram of MDMA, uh, one gram of mixed use uh, heroin, uh, and, and I, I, I want to make sure that, that our listeners and viewers understand that it, it, we didn't authorize a free for all. What we're saying is that if you get, uh, I hate to use the term, if you get busted with these materials, Oregon will no longer treat them like a punishable offense. They will treat them like a public health issue which is something that people like me, uh, I've been a, 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 a supporter and an advocate for the, uh, the nonprofit organization maps, the multidisciplinary association of psychedelic studies, along with, uh, organizations like leap, uh, law enforcement against prohibition, where the, the approach there is, look, we're not saying drugs are good. We're not saying drugs should be everywhere for all people. What we're saying is that we need to stop treating drugs, drug possession and drug use as a criminal led a, a law enforcement issue, but and rather, treat it rather like a health, a public a health issue. Health issue. Um, yeah. And one other thing that 110 provides for is the establishment of addiction recovery centers yes. so that so that it, it it doesn't just change the law and say, OK, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to check people in jail anymore. It actually sets up that they've got somewhere to go. Yeah. What 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 it winds up being now, if you are caught in possession of any of these things in any of these amounts, 
Uh, instead of it being, and I believe that in Oregon, uh, possession of heroin uh, was class A, you were going to see fines in the range of $4,500 and the potential to wind up uh, with a year in jail. Now, what it will be is if you are caught within the personal use possession amounts, you will either pay a $100 fine or you can opt to go to a drug education center and a drug uh, use recovery center and you can take a class there to uh, to mitigate that fine, uh, replace that fine, and you will be given the opportunity and the community resources to pursue recovery if you so choose. Um, wow. And so, you know... The I resources did, part that's important. Exactly. And... Slash money. And well, <laughs> what's good about that, though, is that 110 takes into account the cost of those centers and builds those costs in where we're not just going to say, and you can go, go find yourself some recovery. The resources are built in where every community, every, every jurisdiction will have a mandated and supported recovery center where people can go and get help if they feel they need help. Now, I mean, there's some argument that a lot of people are going to say, I don't need help. Frankly, I understand that. There is a growing movement within uh, psychiatric circles that acknowledges that many people can choose to use substances and not have them interfere with their life, not have them interfere with their employment, carry on about their day. This is really a movement now that is starting to acknowledge that legislating people's states of consciousness is probably not the way to go. Um, and, you know, we can talk all we want about, you know, all three of us grew up in the dare generation <laughs> and, and it accomplished, well, I was going to say it accomplished nothing. No, what it did was it accomplished a lot of drug addiction because the forbidden mm -hmm. fruit syndrome of don't do this, never do this, never do this, that set generations of kids out looking for experiences that were yep. overhyped and, you know, people cracking eggs and frying pans on television and shit like that. It didn't, <clears throat> it didn't work. It's a massive failure. And mm -hmm. many, many, many law enforcement agencies were the most vocal supporters saying, we're, we're not doing any good here. All we're doing is shoving a lot of people into jail f when they harmed no one. Arguably, they might not even have harmed themselves. And uh, that's really significant to me. That view is starting to grow where people are realizing not only is this not effective, but these drug enforcement policies disproportionately affected people of color um, and, and people, uh, in low income brackets that didn't have the financial resources to get good representation in court, um, their, their accusations against them might've been spurious in the first place. It's just, it disproportionately harmed, uh, the, the black community, the Hispanic community. Uh, 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 do I want El, El Capo and a bunch of drug Kings in jail? Yeah, probably. But what would really help is understanding and accepting that people want to take drugs sometimes. They do. They have all throughout history. Taking it away from the crime and punishment backbone of our society and turning it into a public health issue where we can then talk about things like harm reduction, danger mitigation. Um, you know, if you choose to use <laughs> these things, how can you use them and not harm yourself or harm other people and provide an avenue for those people who do feel that their use has gotten out of control, provide them a way to seek help that doesn't stigmatize them. Their possession will not be reflected on things like uh, job applications, uh, you know, criminal <laughs> records that are, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just visualizing all of these other things 
that people who don't let's let's say necessarily take drugs, but they all have their drug that they're into. Oh, so yeah. I initially visualized a guy who works out too much, right? You know, mm-hmm. and they're like, okay, we're gonna send you to therapy for this as long as and I'm all these descriptions and parts of this law that are gonna be enacted in Oregon are awesome and i'm applying them all to this guy working out you know as long as you're not hurting yourself or, put the bar- or other people put the barbell down own- put the barbell down walk away step away from well yeah uh, yeah yeah and that, uh, that you know that is that is one way you could go with it and and uh, yeah it's it's terribly amusing to think about there there are models for this no that, but, that but work. what i'm I saying mean, is everybody like, has their addiction yeah, so, and it doesn't have to be drugs. And think of all the kind of addictions that are not drugs that have ruined relationships. Oh, sure. I agree. Like video games, porn, playing right. video games. What mm-hmm. exactly? Yeah, porn. You know, and, and, and that's just. Every- I think that that's an interesting point, Mark, that you bring up is this this difference between legislating against drugs versus legislating against addiction. And the treatment of drugs as this special kind of addiction that is nothing but damaging. Seriously, I I agree with you. I have at least two or three people in my life whose perfectly good relationship with a partner in one way or another was ruined by things like video games or gambling or... Right. uh, Again, any fill in the blank. You know, you can literally get addicted to anything can you get physiologically addicted to anything Mm, arguably maybe not but psychological addiction is really the the driver of this 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 (laughs) bugaboo yeah exactly mental health overall and uh, you know uh, again being addicted to just sitting here doom scrolling the news for the last week i literally had to uninstall a couple of my facebook apps occurrences so that i just didn't have the ability to act on that compulsion to see what's going on now see what's going on now what's going on now did it change did it change did it so <laughs> addiction in and of it's itself been a crazy week oh brother. man crazy and, week. Oh, yeah uh so but let's <laughs> let's move on to the other side of what's happened here in oregon and that not only have we decriminalized most hard drugs and to be clear uh, you know we're all just we're all just learning about what the impact of this decriminalization will be. And, and none of us have hard and fast specifics on it, aside from what we've been told in the news, but something else that was a separate, uh, a a separate vote was the legalization, not the decriminalization, the legalization of psilocybin, which is the psychoactive component of what everybody refers to as magic mushrooms the legalization of psilocybin to be used in a therapeutic setting for people with mental health issues. Um, that's been, that's been legalized. So again, to be clear to our listeners, that doesn't mean that everybody can start growing their own mushrooms. Uh, as far as I understand, that's still prohibited. Um, and, and even though mushrooms, and this is where things get a little bit confusing where mushrooms are, one of the prohibited substances that used to be illegal possession of mushrooms is now decriminalized. And this whole movement has really blossomed now. And not only has it blossomed for treatment of things like cluster headaches, some of the other really significant things that we're finding over the years that psilocybin is very effective at are things like PTSD, um, end of life cancer therapy, uh, not to mitigate the effects of cancer, but to make people feel better about the life that they have now and to uh, effectively um, be okay with dying from cancer. Um, the, the studies alone on the use of psilocybin for clinically resistant depression are massive. And the, the number one group of people who are most excited about this movement here in Oregon are mental health researchers and mental health therapists because their boots on the ground knowledge of people coming in and saying, you know, yeah, I'm on all these 
you know, antidepressants and that, you know, what really helped. I did a mushroom trip about three weeks ago and I felt golden <laughs> ever since then. If I could, if yeah, I could go ahead in here Chris, for yeah. a moment, uh, it's, it's actually kind of a mixed bag with the mental health community here in Oregon. Um, there certainly have been, and, and we, we saw some of this in the run up, uh, particularly in the literature and, and, and sort of the discussion, you know, the pros and the cons, the fors and against, um, Oregon psychiatric Phys physicians association and the American psychiatric association both came out against, uh, saying that, and, and, and this is where it gets, their argument was a little bit absurd because they came out saying there wasn't enough data that supported the use of psilocybin to treat any sort of uh, mental illness disorders. Well, okay, if you look at the bill itself and the structure, it basically gives the um, Oregon Health Authority the mandate to construct a program for research in the next two years to get this collect data yeah yeah we're essentially <laughs> saying hi we're your data collection point we will be we will be using our state as a as both a testing ground and a a data collection point in order to have this data that we will be able to look at to see if there is therapeutic potential here in the future and it's very similar to what happened um oh, as a four, three, four years ago, um, when MDMA, uh, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, also known as ecstasy, was given breakthrough status by the FDA for use in clinical resistant depression, as well as the treatment of PTSD. And it's organizations like MAPS that are almost wholly and totally responsible for the FDA giving this a shot. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand. They think, well, do the research and find it out. It's not as simple as just doing the research. When you're talking about a class one substance, um, a schedule one substance, the amount of hurdles that any researcher or even like a research university has to go through to be allowed to do that research is Everest sized. It is just a massive amount of bureaucracy to even so much as start testing these things. So one of the things that this is going to be doing here in Oregon is, is, is allowing much more, more robust research so that we can get that data and get those answers. Nobody and here, we can figure out. Yeah. If, not, if, e not if even, there's I a am, there. yeah, not even I am saying this is going to help. I've got my own personal experience on it, and I know many people that do have personal experience on it, but that's not really data. That's anecdotal that's anec evidence. Anecdotes, yep. And data is, you know, in this post-fact world now, data is still data. Numbers are still numbers, and results are still results. And we can't get any of that unless some state steps forward. And again, we run on a state and a federal level. Our federal yeah. drugs, our federal drug laws have not changed. It is still wholly and totally against federal law to possess psilocybin. But here in Oregon, our priorities as far as the law goes. Manpower. Is, exactly. Is just, we're not going to be doing that. We're not going to be hunting people down for an eighth of shrooms. That's dumb. It wastes everybody's time. It wastes all our money. Instead, let's well, yeah. take some of that money. It's and a victimless put it into crime. It is completely a victimless crime. And let's take some of that money that we used to use prosecuting and persecuting and turn it into something valuable like data so that we can say, no, look, we've done the research. It's been triple vetted and it's been looked at by 37 different agencies. And you're not going to melt your brain with psilocybin if you do it reasonably. And not only that, right. if you are really that depressed, head over to this clinic and work with a good licensed clinical social worker or somebody else who's been vetted and, and has the ability to provide this for you in a therapeutic way, in a therapeutic setting. And oh my God, maybe get some benefit out of it. This mm -hmm. idea that we demonize things and not behaviors is one of the ways that we've gotten into this mess we have with this incarceration nation 
of just pumping people into our prisons because they wanted to change their minds. Um, and that's only they should outlaw sugar. Oh right? My God, how many how many more people go to the emergency room every year from doing too much sugar? And how big is the sugar, diabetes? Sugar uh, is, is a massive part of the American health crisis. Of dollars go get pumped into and are you know part of the economy. You know, there's a you know there's a need. You know, you got to fill it, and somebody makes yeah. it, and they sell it to whoever needs whatever. Yeah, nobody says sugar uh, is supposed to be outlawed. You know, you got what are you going to outlaw cereal? How many kids in America? Don't would you not dare! Be? Right. Yeah, oh, don't miss, touch my cereal. I still miss cereal. Fruity Pebbles. Anyways, <laughs> we are going to take another break here, just uh, from all of us here at the Harris Victory Garden Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We will be back in just a few seconds. I'd love to say two and two, but I think Chuck Woolery's a douche. We'll be back in just a minute. <laughs> Looking for an awesome gift for the cannabis enthusiast in your life? Look no further. HVG has you covered. Nothing says freedom like the collector's edition compendium of all things Jack Herrer. Jack in the Box. This limited edition definitive Jack Herrer collection is an awesome way to learn about cannabis and hemp and to help celebrate the life and enduring legacy of hemp pioneer Jack Herrer. Jack in the Box includes Jack Hare's humorous and insightful book, Grass, as well as the best-selling hemp Bible, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, and the full-length Jack Hare documentary, The Emperor of Hemp, narrated by Emmy Award-winning actor Peter Coyote. And each Jack in the Box will be personally signed by Jack's son, Mark Hare, of the Hare's Victory Garden podcast. Make sure to head over to hvgpodcast.com now. Click the Jack in the Box link, and get your copy today. And we're back at the Harris Victory Garden podcast featuring Mark Hare. I'm Andrew Scott. That's Chris Picano, and that is Mark Hare. And uh, as Mark was just mentioning, mentioning off air, uh, we're turning into the kings of running long. But uh, you know, a few things a few things happened over the intervening time between this episode and the last, and uh, we had a few things to talk about. But uh, we got a lot to be thankful for, and we're heading up towards that time of year. It's definitely going to be a let's call it unique Thanksgiving. But let's do a quick roundtable about uh, about thankfulness. I'm thankful more than anything, uh, as we touched on earlier, that the ele- while well, I'm thankful the election's over. Uh, and I'm putting over in air quotes here because we all know how this is going to drag out for a little bit, but I'm truly, I'm truly thankful that this election proved to the world that our mechanism of democracy still works, is resilient and can get the job done even at the worst of times. I'm thankful for the health of my family and piles and piles of other stuff. And I'm thankful for the people of Oregon for seeing through a lot of smoke and going, no, we need, we need to change the way we do things as far as drugs go here in, in this state. And we're going to lead the way in, in what I hope to be a wave of reform that, uh, follows in the same, uh, path that the legalization and decriminalization here of cannabis did, uh, for the rest of the world. Chris, give me, give me something that you're thankful for. So, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that, that we're into November and 2020 is almost over. Um, <laughs> and, and that, and that for the most part, you know, we've all survived. Uh, but, but really d- drilling into that, um, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that this is a year that has really, really tested our metal, uh, collectively in a lot of different ways. And, We've, as world citizens, right? As Every world citizens, citizen absolutely, world absolutely, not that. just Americans, Crazy not just reason. Oregonians. Yep. yep, worldwide, humanity has been tested, and I, you know, I'm thankful because when I when I really try to look at it objectively, we've we've proven we're resilient, we're stubborn, we're we're creative, we're inventive. Um, and, and we've got this will to go on 
and I'm 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 thankful for that. I'm I'm and and I'm thankful that we're capable. The other thing, the other thing I've really seen this year is we are capable of incredible acts of kindness and generosity and heroism. Uh, I just by being ordinary people. Yeah, we still have the capability of being our best selves and being our better angels. Mark, what do you got? You know, one thing dad always told me is, uh, and he told everybody, he says, if you don't vote, you're not entitled to an opinion. So I guess I'm kind of thankful that people, uh, no matter what you vote for, uh, that you registered to vote and you voted, and we may not always agree or even see eye to eye or might not even like each other, depending on how you vote and what you believe. Uh, I don't know if I'm thankful, but, you know, with change comes a lot of pain, generally speaking. So, I, unfortunately, I think this year kind of had to happen to re-stoke the fires of freedom around the world. Because uh, not just America, you know, F George Floyd wasn't just an American citizen. He was a world citizen. And a lot of the world, I mean, in tens of countries, if not, you know, a hundred plus countries, uh, on some level had protests in their own streets and in their own squares and, uh, and, and put up murals and uh, put you up, know, around I mean, the world, you know, around uh, the world. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm thankful, uh, in a horribly bitter, bittersweet sort of way that, uh, we are talking again. Um, it's going to be a long time before people can agree that all people are people, uh, that we're all citizens of the world. Uh, we're all immigrants and, uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful again, you know, mm, change yeah, is painful, I'm, but, uh, I'm nauseously we're, we're as, moving forward. Yeah. As was, <laughs> as was said on the news recently, I'm nauseously optimistic. Uh, <laughs> and uh with that we're gonna wrap for this episode of harry's victory garden podcast uh it's been a long year but we've got one more episode to say uh hello and goodbye with uh 2020 and uh we're you know until then everybody keep washing your hands keep wearing your masks keep being good to each other we need to start embracing the, the being good to each other again. And on behalf of the Harris Victory Garden Podcast, I'm Andrew Scott, that's Chris Ficano, and that is the guy named Mark Hare. Again, wear a mask, wash your hands, be kind, and we'll see you next time on Harris Victory Garden Podcast. So long, and thanks for Peace voting. Peace out. Peace out. Keep it lit. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Harris Victory Garden, cultivating freedom since 1973. Harris Victory Garden is a narrow band broadcast network production in conjunction with PodSquadPDX.com. Andrew Scott, executive producer. Chris Vacano, associate producer. Website design and maintenance, BCS Creative, Chris Vacano, webmaster. Music, courtesy Ron Kajawa Music online at ronkajawamusic.com. Make sure to follow us on social media and on the web at hvgpodcast.com. On behalf of the boys, I'm Heather Chamberlain. Thanks for listening. NBBN. The Narrow Band Broadcast Network. The focus is on you.